Good afternoon to everybody and thank you so much for joining us at the first ever annual African Family Business Research Conference. And for this afternoon, our last session, we have a panel discussion. And in this panel, we are going to be discussing succession and values in family business. I'm sure everybody who's joined us from this morning has seen all the presentations on succession and on values in the family, as well as getting your children involved in the family. And we've brought back every one of our speakers and we've added to our panel, we have the lovely Miss Andrea uh, Birkenstein. Did I get that right? Birkenstein, almost. Birkenstein, okay. <laughs> and um, she's joining us from PWC, African Family Business Center of Excellence. We have once again, Professor Venter from NMU, Dr. Beck from NMU, Professor Farrington from NMU, uh, Mr. Kupangwa from NMU, and from AFF, we have uh, Mrs. Mike Alani. So welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this um, very interesting panel session. I have got lots and lots of questions. So to keep it um, moving along, I will ask the question and then I will give everyone a chance to answer on the question. And um, then we'll keep it moving like that. If anyone who has joined us has any questions from the previous session or any questions for this panel in line with succession and va family values, please type it into your chat box at the bottom of your screen or use the question and answer um, box at the bottom of your screen and I will give it to the panelists. If it's for a specific panelist, please make sure that you include that in your question. Otherwise, I will pose the question to all the panelists that we have this afternoon. So to get us going and to kick us off, I'm going to have to ask Professor Farrington, I'm putting you in the hot seat because you've just come from doing your presentation and uh, followed uh, by Wellington before I give it to the rest of the panel. Why are values so important, Professor Farrington? Well, if you recall from my presentation, values play a big role in um, shaping the organizational culture. They provide direction for the vision and mission. Uh, it's rules of behavior. And, and, you know, if a, if a business wants to embed what they, the family, what they stand for, it's important that their values are entrenched, as Mr. Kupangwa says. And in, in actual fact, these values set the, the scene or set the stage for how the business operates and, of course, where it's going to go to. Right. And Mr. <laughs> oh, it's... It, it, it. You see, because of the fluidity of values, the nature of values, anything that we do, there's some sort of philosophical assumptions, philosophical philosophy that guides what we do. Anything, how we sometimes talk, how sometimes we relate to each other. Let me start from there. Now to take that into family business, the same principle, it's even worse. Because as, as we now have seen from the presentation, values in the case of family businesses are even more relational. It's about those soft, we call them soft skills or soft competencies. You know, being honest, being a hard, a hard worker, being someone who is kind, being someone who is respectful, someone who treats other people with dignity. So if one has got that kind of a pack of soft skills, then it also translates, or it might translate, that the family business, its behavior, is also going to be reflecting that philosophy. So they do play a very important role. As Prof. say, they do play a very crucial role. Failure to have values in place, it also you know, breaks down the flow of things uh, in the family business, particularly between uh, members, uh, not just of the family, but between people or individuals within the family. And we, we, we see that uh, may, most of the times, I have to add one thing. One of the families that I in, interviewed, I, I did not include the, the participant because I'm still working on, a, on the participant. Even though I presented the values, very important, important values, 
very good values. But the participant that I then interviewed after the, the, that interview is a non-family employee who then said, you know, very emotional. Actually, she cried when she was describing the pain of some of the treatments that she experiences in this particular family business. And that can also affect the way then she then performs. She then delivers the mandate of the, of the family business. And I just want to highlight that, that if we don't have values, then it also means that we do not really, really know what philosophical assumptions that probably can guide our, our behaviors and actions in the family business. Thank you, sir. And then I'll have Ms. Andrea. Thanks both. Um, I think the importance of values, it's sure, it, it drives your behavior. So whatever you do is done in order to fulfill a value. So even though you're unlikely to be consciously aware of that value, um, everything you do is a means to an end and this end is to fulfill the fulfillment of a value. Um, you do it either to move towards a pleasurable feeling of, or a value or move away from to avoid pain, uh, painful values or feelings. So all of this is, is done most of the time in your subconscious. Um, so few people have an awareness of their values. Um, they're more on autopilot, but driven by values that, that you, and maybe that you do not know exist. Um, but in family, but businesses and families, if you know what that value is and you know what you're working towards, you know what your philosophy is um, and you communicate that well and you communicate it with, with the family members, with your employees um, and everybody is on the same page and transparent, it becomes extremely powerful. So we did a study in 2018, the um, PwC of a family business survey and they say and 85% of the respondents who had a double digit, digit growth was because of um, their values and um, a strong focus on their values and their purpose. And the employees also said that they would rather work for a company like that. Um, their job satisfaction was higher if they knew what the purpose was, what the values were that they're living towards and um, living for. Thank you. And Dr. Beck? Um, for me, I would echo what my panelists all have said but also to say that the family values become the cornerstone of what the business is trying to embody. And that becomes part of the vision, the mission, and the drive of the business. Uh, and of course, as the business is continuing, as we're growing as a society, maybe new things come into play as well. Looking at things like social justice and those kind of things also come into the business as you become more open and aware of the values that are also in society. Okay, Mike. Yes, I agree with everything um, the panelists have said. And just thinking about it from family businesses desiring generational businesses, so looking long term, um, we face a lot of complexities, both within the family, as the family grows exponentially um, with more children, grandchildren, new generations. In the business, as we're trying to potentially have new markets, have new products, new technologies and the like. And also um, our world has become extremely complex. So with these increased complexities and on all these three levels, values really serve as a compass. So we don't end up being fragmented, being pulled in different directions, but we really have a focus to this is where we're heading towards because we know who we are. And Professor Farrington, you wanted to add something? Uh, just from a sort of a practical example, I was in business with my two brothers for almost 15 years. And I can remember when we started out, my younger brother was like the leader and he was a real stickler for the rules. He's a very strong Christian principled man. And I can remember many occasions where we, we, is, we were in the building industry and there were like some shady builders who wanted to avoid VAT payments and those kind of deals. And my brother was so strict in terms of that's not how we operate. And the, so in that way, the, his values clearly directed our behavior and it also contributed to the longevity of the business. Now, 20, 25 years later, his business is still going. And what we have found over the years is that those shady builders would, are actually coming to him for business because they know that he can be trusted. 
and that's how you know in in his ex- or his work experience and his family business how he made sure that the values directed decisions and it's contributed to to family to the success of the business all right thank you and um professor venter I, we haven't heard from you yet Thank you, Titi. I hope at the end of this week you will call me Almeri, please. <laughs> um, uh, this morning in the two sessions, um, Shelley Beck and I had, um, there was quite a lot of questions that we haven't answered. And um, one of the questions was, um, how does, is, is succession different from in Africa? And, um, and I think that's where values come in. But I also want to strongly say that religion comes in here as well. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert on strategy and culture, so forgive me if I confuse the two, too, if, you know, but, but um, what I found is uh, in the PwC group we had in January, they were, it was the first time that there was five African countries in the group, but there was also some Muslim businesses, um, uh, consultants in the group. And I had the privilege a few years back to work with a group of Indian successors uh, when I taught in the Netherlands. And you know, religion plays a very important role and that's part of the values and the culture. Like Shelley um, said now, you know, in their business, Christian values plays a very important role. But it, 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 it definitely has an influence on succession. For example, in, in Muslim businesses, the, the woman will never consult in a group like we do with, um, in my consulting with uh, Western businesses, you know, the whole family is together in a group the first day or two. But in a Muslim business, you cannot do that. So the consultants have to consult with the woman separately, and Andrea can perhaps also comment on that. Um, and then in the Indian family businesses, the woman plays a critical role, but they never they never the a public face of succession. So even if the daughter, we have a business like this close to where we live, where the daughter runs the business and she's a father's right hand. And then just recently the brother and the cousin came in and they now the face of that business. It's a huge business. So however unfair it may be, religion and certain cultural values, namely to appoint the oldest son or a son or a man uh, as the next successor, that is just a given in certain cultures and certain religions. So uh, in that sense, I, I hope it answers the question, yes, 70% challenges are the same, and we can learn from that, but, but again, you have to take that into account, especially when you do research among these businesses and also um, when you consult to them, you have to respect their religion and you have to respect their culture. Okay, just to further on that, uh, Professor Venter, I will uh, pose the next question to start with you and as we go on to the other members of the panel. Looking at what you've just said, how do family values contribute to the identity of the family business? That is an excellent question, and it almost led on to what my two colleagues just um, said in their presentation. But for example, when I go into a consultation process, like um, Welcome said, you know, it's the softer issues that cause the problem. And I know yesterday, Nikkei, uh, also refer to that and, and um, you know it's it's the invisible it's the inactive members it's the spouses that often you know turn off the screws in that business so um, when I start a consulting uh, process I always start with the softer issues so uh, I want to repeat that a family is made up of individual members with their own values and with um, their own expectations and you have to manage that and um, when I go from the personal visions to the family vision, I ask them, you know, have you ever thought about what makes this family successful? And how do you translate it to your operational processes? Because we often talk about a vision and a mission, but that means nothing. Because at the end of the day, if there's conflict in the family or between the family members in the business, you can talk about values as much as you want to. And to, just to give one example, um, I was in a consultation with this family for almost two years. 
And then they invited me as a guest to discuss an issue um, during the board meeting. So I was not a member of the board, I just sat in. And one of the values, they said they're very ethical family. And the first decision um, at the board meeting was to whether they should um, be able to subtract the new farmhouse as a business expense. And um, the other outside uh, member of the board was an actuary. And he says, stop the bus, stop the bus. You know, so you have to live your values. And as Nico said, you know, it becomes a social vehicle. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a vehicle. So you have to also not only know what these values are, but it must show to the outside world because otherwise you're not going to be able to leave that legacy. So family need to be aware of what is their purpose, what are their values, but they also need to translate it to the everyday operations in the business. Thank you. And Andrea? Sure. Um, the families I've worked with, it's always so amazing. You would start asking the individuals uh, what their values are, what drives their behavior, what drives their decision making. Um, and there would always be like some distinct um, examples like integrity or hard work or um, entrepreneurial spirit. And those ones are like, you can see it fundamental through the whole business and how they operate and how they do things. And um, when we write family constitution, every question you ask them while you're building the or working through the constitution, um, that is like the golden thread that goes through through the, the whole principles and guidance and how they live, um, which is very amazing. And um, that's just also it enables them to be more in control of their actions and their emotions when conflict arises, um, how the outside world perceives them. Um, how they do business, how they work with the employees. So that whole identity uh, and, and the direction of the company. And then another very important one, uh, I see we've also discussed that in the one o'clock um, session, but the parents and how they live the values and whether the children, whether they subscribe to it or not. Because I've seen where the children, where they don't agree with the value or where they maybe have different views, that's usually the biggest clash um, and for the succession and where they want to be part of the business, whether they want to continue um, and, and yeah, taking the business forward. It's usually this, this, the behavior and the values that uh, drives that. So very interesting. Right, and Dr. Beck? Yes, I just want to maybe go on to the other parents part of it and just say for me that's all about getting the exposure from the early years is to instill those cornerstones within the, the children and for me that's where the beginning starts um, yes you do go into have certain times where you're not going to agree but if fundamentally at the family level that you believe in integrity and in hard work it's going to carry through um, what I can also say is that if you have that same thing that we were talking about this morning, communication, communication, even if it is difficult, um, where, for example, now where the actuary that Prof. Fenter was talking about um, said, well, let's stop the bus, it was an open discussion and it wasn't just agreed upon without consultation. So when you've got the, the ability to have these discussions and to openly dis um, talk to each other, I think that also helps to foster um, the values. Um, but also just to have a look even further is in these kinds of difficult times where we're in now with COVID, this is what's gonna come to the fore is because businesses are trying to survive. And if they don't have these critical values, this is when the family businesses are going to go into jeopardy. So 100% the family values have to pull through to the next generation. Thank you, and Nikkei? Yes, I completely agree with everything that all the panelists have said. And um, the thing is, a lot of family values, this is the way we do things, are not necessarily explicitly defined, um, particularly in first generation. And it really takes a lot of reflection and def explicit definition of the family members. So this is who we are. Um, as I think it was welcome alluded to, sometimes there's a tension. Um, the values between first and second generation may change and collectively how do we define who we are and ensure that 
as a family, it's reflective of all of us. And then these values and then passed on into the, fam um, into the business. Professor Farrington? I think as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, that um, your family, your question initially was how family values related to the identity of the family business or how do they um, influence the identity. And if you recall from my presentation, I, my whole presentation was about how values shape the organizational culture. So the values shape the cult organizational culture, the organizational culture being the way things are, happen around you, who we are and what we do. And in that way, Influences the family business identity. And Mr. Kupara, Okay, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm, I was I'm having a technical problem, so I'm using my phone so that you can see me. This computer is, doesn't want to work. Yes, we can hear you I, I loud think, and clear. I think, I think, you know, values are the ingredients. I, I like I like the example that. Prof Parenton gave us their ingredients. So if you put something is with their ingredients, you know, you're going to combine, you know, I don't know how to bake, but I think, uh, you know, you, you ladies probably know it more <laughs> than I do. And when you bake, you know, you take some salt, sugar, flour, I don't know, other things. And then the process of doing that, that's what I was trying to explain in terms of in entrenchment. And then the outcome of it is then now what we then see is now the cake or the muffin or the, you know, sandwich or whatever, you know, we don't bake sandwiches, but anyway, <laughs> but we, we, we have to see values as ingredients. In my presentation, what I did not do is I did not show you which ones are family values, which ones are business values. And when do family values change from being family to a business value? And that's you know what I'm trying to to do you know, now. Uh, hopefully, by end of December, you get the proper you know you know stuff. But if if we have wrong ingredients, then of course ultimately you're going to have wrong outputs or wrong uh, products. So there are values that lead to only behavior. They have values that lead only to strategic, but also they have values that lead to uh, the ethics of the business as a whole. So we need to categorize the values. There are certain values that are just values. You know, we, we just know their values. But then there are also values that lead to certain actions. And what also people value also differs. It's also different. Some people might value the input, the ingredient, which is honesty, hard work, and all that. Some people might value the process, which is, it could be the marketing uh, in terms of businesses. It could be the, the culture of the business. Some businesses might also value the outcome, competitiveness, business performance in terms of profit, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, you can name it, you know, uh, business performance is quite broad. So, do you values really, uh, values important? Yes, of course, there's no doubt they're very important. Do they influence the business performance? Definitely they influence business performance in terms of succession, in terms of the growth of the business, in terms of the innovativeness or innovation of the business, in terms of the, uh, uh, I'm forgetting the last one that I was, was about to say it, uh, in terms of continuity of the business. So we need to see values as ingredients which will lead to certain outcomes at the end of the day. And um, Almarie, you had something to add on to that? Thank you very much. Um, I, I actually want to comment on both welcome, but especially on Dr. Beck's comment. And I think it's more important than we realize. And that is, I can remember one time when I did a constitution, family constitution for a family who was quite a bigger family. They um, already had, um, you know, there was a lot of cousins. And um, what they do is they actually let the family, individual families go back and discuss the issues that was discussed in the whole family uh, about the constitution in their own family, because um, I have currently a doctorate student that just started and she's doing something on leadership 
amongst millennials and uh, generation X and Z. And that for me is fascinating. I know very little about it, but I love it. Because the problem is millennials think differently. I, I think it was you, Onika, that said it this morning as well. There's a, there's a gap between how millennials think and Generation Z think. And I have children that's in both. And um, I think don't underestimate that the younger generation may have their own values that influence what they say, uh, you know, when there's a family discussion or a family constitution discussion. So I found it very nice and practical um, that they've done it themselves, you know, so they, they would discuss something and then every family will actually draw up their own constitution. So it will be child, child X uh, a constitution for their family, but it filters through to the, to the family constitution. So I thought that was very nice. I've never seen it, uh, but that's what Shelley said. I think don't underestimate that children may have their own values that they also add uh, because they're in a different generation than the older generation. Thank you for that. And just um, following up on that, Almarie, when we are looking at issues of governance and looking at building, especially a family constitution, uh, being that we have a lot of families that are still very small in terms of their family business and haven't yet gone into the process of formulating family constitutions. But then just starting the conversation and going into it, values are one of the most important aspects of a family constitution. What are the typical questions you ask families when you're in the process of creating a family constitution? And I think I'll start with Nike as a family uh, business owner. What are some of the questions that you've gotten in uh, formulating your family constitution and that you found are very important, especially when looking at values? Mm. We actually haven't undergone a process of a formal family governance structure, but we've had many kind of reflective sessions. Who are we as a family? Um, what is important to us? Um, what do we want to see in a hundred years? Um, for each of us individually and for all of us collectively as a family and then separately what do we want to see in the family business what do we want to be remembered for um, what imprints do we want to leave in the community these are the kind of um, conversation starters that through those conversations it becomes very clear for each person what is important to them as individuals and collectively as a family so right now we're still using natural governance we're in the process of formalizing our family governance. Yeah. Andrea? Um, are you asking a family constitution in general or just the part, the values part within the constitution? Um, I think especially the values part within the family constitution, what typical um, questions do, would you ask families when you're in the process of helping them create their family constitution? Okay, fantastic. Um, so we would start to ask about the family about their history and their identity. Um, it's usually wonderful to listen to where it started. It's, for instance, the um, one family I interviewed last week was, I mean, the 11th generation. So to year and I went to visit the farm. So to see all the stories and the letters, the love letters between the grandfathers and all of those, just the identity and where they come from, the history and um, so on, that's, that's amazing. Um, so we usually start that just to build the whole legacy. Um, then we ask them, uh, they need to think about the needs, the values of the family versus the demands and the values of the business. Um, because within a family, it's usually about the security and the well-being and equality uh, versus in business, it's more about competition and performance hierarchy. So those two clash. Uh, then we ask them what type of um, business family they are um, or family business that they want to be. Um, what do they want to achieve? Uh, what roles do they want to commit to? What's their vision, mission and culture? Um, we go to what are the goals and the values for the family business and then also for the business family. So depending on who sits around the table, um, we usually want them actually to involve the rest of the family so not only the people that's in the business so to ask them what's their personal values um what do they see as a goal for the for the family and the family business 
um, that's very important. And then when you have, for instance, a one family I'm working with, it's 18 people sitting around the table. So you get quite different views, which is amazing. And, and that's actually the benefit of a family business, having those different views. Um, and then just selecting, for instance, the top five to focus on and to build on. Um, we also ask them, what's their understanding? Um, what, so for instance, what the business can expect from the family. And then also what the family can exp expect from the business. Because there's usually different expectations. Um, as you know, the 3D model, so even when you put in the ownership uh, part as well, that's also more, more different expectations and views and, and so on. And then, yeah, we also ask what they want to be known for uh, in the market, in their communities going forward. Uh, yeah, they view themselves. So those are just a couple of questions we'll ask. Thank you. And Dr. Beck? Um, I just want to agree with the rest of the panel um, in just terms of trying to make um, the, the whole family being part of it. I think that for me is to try and get down to what the actual business is going to focus on. I'm just thinking now of the example of 18 people around a boardroom. I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, I can just think of my own family. It would be absolute chaos. Uh, so definitely to try and bring that down and to find consensus, not just... Um, on maybe five, but I'm just trying to think that if yours were left out, would you really be committed um, to what is embodied by the business and trying to find this um, way of trying to get the interconnectedness even without having your specific values in that. So that for me is quite a, a big thing and something actually to think about because I didn't realize even that so many people of a seven, eight, eleventh generation, um, you know, that, that for me is mind boggling. Um, and then just also just looking at the, all the different answers and just thinking of how different all of our businesses are that we're talking about today and the uniqueness of the values that we're even bringing up in this discussion um, and how that is actually, hopefully we can document this um, even through welcome study. I think this is going to be something that not just family businesses should be looking at, but non-family businesses to bring in more of the soft issues, particularly in the times that we're living in and to focus on our societies and our communities. Thank you. And Professor Farrington? Um, I haven't done much consultation with regard, no consultation with regard to setting up constitutions, but from my own experience, I can remember after 15 years in business with my brothers, we were nowhere near anything that was even remotely like a constitution. I think at most we had some kind of mission statement that we stuck up um, on the wall somewhere. But um, in terms of that and in governance, you know, I can recall the first five years basically sitting around my mom's dining room table with kids running around and um, in-laws butting in, trying to make decisions about buying stuff. And we got to a stage where everyone had their own area and you basically went ahead in your, your division or your department. But it was almost like, and I think that's the case in many businesses, you're so busy with the business of business that the stuff like sitting down, sitting and discussing who we are, what we do, that I think possibly only comes later. You know, but when you, you're so busy just trying to keep the money in the bank, the money coming in, the business of business, um, and that's where I think con consultants play a big role in actually just drawing family business members' attention to something like a constitution. I mean, I never even knew there was something like a constitution. Only when I started doing research in family businesses and met Elmery that I was aware of something like that. You know, we literally just flew by the seat of our pants, were concerned with filling up the bank, doing the business of business, and having meetings and making decisions around the dining room table. You know, so um, I, think, I think a lot of family businesses, first, they don't even know that they are family businesses, that they have this unique nature, and they're not even necessarily aware of all these structures and the support that can actually assist them in achieving their potential. Thank you. And um, Mr. Kupangwa? I, I have to say, uh, I haven't done any consultation as well. I haven't seen a family constitution. You know, I'm yet to see one. I'm looking forward to see one. Uh, I, I, I might have ideas of what might come in or my, what should be included. Uh, you know, obviously, values, uh, the, the, the the identity of the family, because you know we start from the family moving out to the business. 
So I think, you know, the identity of the family should come up more strongly and how it also influences the family and the issues of, of uh, transferring of shares. I, I want to assume those are things maybe that could be consistent in a family constitution. But I haven't seen one <laughs> myself. I'm really looking forward uh, to see one. Okay, and we're going to have Almarie again. I'm sure you have something to share with us with regards to uh, family constitution. I think I've lost, oh, there she is. Um, we can't hear you, Almarie. Mm. Sorry about that. Okay. Sorry about that. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, even if it's a small business, you ask the question, what are the type of things that, that we can discuss on philosophy and values? So I start with a question, you know, is it business first or family first? And in an African context, that uh, what I've heard over the last two days is that's actually a very important question because in some cultures, family is first. Uh, whether we tell them it shouldn't be that way, it should be business first and then family. So um, it's very important. Your culture plays a big role. So you need to, you need to understand how does the two systems and even ownership fit in together in your particular family? Uh, you know, the consultant can tell you what works and what doesn't work, but at the end of the day, it must be the family that decides on that. So uh, these are typical questions, um, and I don't want to give it, I will say something about that again on uh, Friday, because this whole session, you know, about governance and um, uh, Titi, you will also come in then, and Dr. Tamaklu, and but for welcome, um, if you're interested in what's in a family constitution, it's all these questions that must be answered, whether you are five family members or whether you are 50 or 200. Uh, so the complexity will just different. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, we st I start my constitu uh, constitution with, uh, with, a, with the questions on philosophy and values. And we have a question here from Pierre Sindambiwe. And um, he's asking, the strong or weak family embeddedness literature explains how the next generation stay in family firms or make their own way in their careers. What values or practices embedded in African culture that you, do you think promote the commitment for the next generation so that they can hope for transgenerational successful succession. And I'll give this to Andrea. Sure, a difficult question, um, but very good question. Um, for the next gen, it's all about, I, I would always say transparency is extremely important. Transparency, they have to open discussions. Um, you have to allow the next gen to say what they think, um, even if they don't agree, just really that they allow them to speak their mind and explain why they have certain views or um, how they how they come up with certain ideas. Uh, sustainability is extremely important to the next gen at the moment, and innovation, like we've heard previously, um, digitization. We next gen they grow up with um, digital platforms and um, technology. I think one of my friends, uh, their child is now in the first grade and they already have robotics as a subject where we didn't grow up with that. So it's mind boggling, amazing, but mind boggling. Um, so they'll definitely come in with different views and different business practices and different ideas. And just to embrace that, embrace it, try to understand it, um, tell them to come with a business idea, uh, or a business plan, and does it make sense? And um, yeah, just that openness, transparency, um, and the entrepreneurial spirit, I think that will really always be a cornerstone for, for succession. And Professor Farrington? I think as I, I showed some of the results of my study, it was quite interesting how the 
the third generation were actually taking the lead in formalizing and, and changing the values, not necessarily changing them, but actually formalizing them, putting them out there. They were taking the lead and this was actually welcomed by the second generation. And what you're finding, although the values were changing, they were still holding on to what was some of the original values. They might have adapted and reworded them slightly, but it was important for them to still keep those original values, which had originally been embedded in the, in the family business by the founders. Mike? Yes, I think I'll comment on the practices required um, to promote commitment of next gen as Andrea kind of alluded to millennials and the next generation desire different things from working from founders and really it's a collaborative culture um they really want to feel seen and heard and they're desiring to make an impact so they're not necessarily um motivated by money alone but really by opportunities for growth for impact um, and really desiring instant, um, instantaneous feedback more so than the previous generation and desiring to be mentored and coached and led um, and guided. And a lot of things, you know, um, a lot of millennials and next generation are passionate about social issues. They want to see how the business's activities are impacting on the wider community, um, they want to understand, you know, that the activities are helping with sustainability, um, with promoting things like gender equity, you know, um, financial inclusion. These are matters that are important to next generation. And so if we're looking to increase the commitment of next generation, then we need to ensure that the practices in our businesses are aligned with that. Dr. Beck? Maybe I just want to talk about some of the things I've, I've heard and listened to and things I've learned from others. And for me, looking at an indigenous African perspective, I've had to listen and take on a lot of the different cultures that, are, that I'm not aware of. Learning about things like totems that many of our African cultures have and they embody and, and represent some form of um, sustainability into the future. The elder generations pass on this knowledge and, and, and stories about how the family um, is embodying a certain way of being and how they, this business came to be is all about um, taking it on for the next generation to be a success and to embody what the family is. So for me, the African culture um, goes far beyond just looking at the, the profit and the financial, but to go so much deeper and to make sure that the family um, business is embodying what the family stands for and represents. Almarie? Yeah, um, I was now laughing because I remember I saw an article on family embeddedness um, and um, I quickly recalled it and it was a study by, and it's a quite interesting perspective, and it was a study by uh, two colleagues. And uh, they actually, in 2060, studied a sample of 23,000 respondents from 19 countries. And they actually found a negative relationship um, between financial support from the family, they called it the poisoned gift, and entrepreneurial intentions. And what, they, what they're saying is that they actually found a negative relationship uh, between family cohesion and entrepreneurial orientation. So that was a very interesting um, finding. So um, family embeddedness is a, is a complex issue and there are many things that, um, that influence that. And as we have heard the past couple of days, um, it's complex, you know, it's not only complex within the African culture, it's complex and it's different for every single family. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a simple answer to, to this question. And welcome. I, I need to, to draw in uh, some insights from participants that I've interviewed. I'm gonna give you two examples. One example is a lady who once left the family business, worked in a very big corporation, two big corporations 
I'm talking about financial institutions. She was getting paid very well. Um, she was take, well taken care of. And she decided to come back only in 2015. Um, that's the lady that I referred to Baba Lua in the study. She has managed to own the space now where she is in the family business, as opposed to when she used to come in and work, sometimes part-time, sometimes full-time, before she took over the, the, not just ownership, but also the leadership of the family business. I give this example, I'm gonna give another one, and you're gonna see the difference. The other business, which I did not report about here, is uh, started by a lady, old lady, who is now transitioning, wants to transition the business from herself to the daughter. And the daughter doesn't want anything to do with the business. The daughter says simply no, and asked what could be the problem. Well, the issue is there are some familial or parental issues that needs to be dealt with first. Uh, there are kind of two contrasting uh, 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 cases here. The family, the first one, the, the, the the child or the children wants to be involved and they're taking ownership, they've been changing, they've even opened a branch in 2000, a new branch in 2018 of the same, you know, what they're doing, they're doing dry cleaning. But the other one, it's completely opposite of what you're seeing. So for me, I think if, as I conceptualize or as I really look into this, the issue or the value of autonomy and how the, the families influence that or build that over a number of years does contribute to whether the next generation will want to be committed to the business or not. And, and the more they have autonomy, children, the more they want now to exercise this autonomy in the family business. If they don't have autonomy, then they feel like they're being suffocated. They feel like they're, they are not being given a space to be in the family business. So that's what I found in the one that uh, where the lady said, no, she doesn't want anything to do with the business uh, because she feels like it, it has always been the mother doing the business. She was, in a way, in this case, or in her own opinion, she wasn't really given autonomy to exercise what she wants to do in this particular business. So hence we see the contrast. So I think the value of autonomy even though it is di difficult to maybe define the context of African culture, but I think it is important that families and family or uh, uh, enterprising families ensure that autonomy is important. But I'm tempted to give another third one example. On Tuesday, which is yesterday in the morning, I had a conversation with one of my participants who I named Patricia. Uh, I saw on, on Twitter, she opened a beauty boutique, I don't know what, these things, you know, for manicure and all the, you know, nice looking, uh, you know, things. And I asked her, oh, is this your business? And she said, yes, she opened it on the 1st of August. And I said, but I remember you also have another business. She's still working in the family business. The value of entrepreneurship, if it is enhanced properly in the family, it does give birth to other enterprises in the family and not just only in the family business which is originally started by the founder but also other subsidiaries that might explode coming out of the family as an entirety so that's interesting to see because i'm talking about someone who is probably my age only 30 years years of age imagine what she could do in the next 10 years in the next 20 years and she's also involving her own siblings in this part of business. I know they've got a construction company which they're starting to build with, with their own uh, nuclear sibling. And then even though she's still involved in the family extended family business, they're also having a taxi. She also introduced uh, kitchen soups in the garages, engine garages, about six of them. The value of entrepreneurship, I repeat again, if it is enhanced properly together with autonomy, then it will result into birth of many enterprising uh, institutions. Thank you, welcome. I've got two more questions uh, before we wrap up this session. So I'm just going to ask um, that we keep our answers as short as possible. And the 
first question that I'll give you is from Guy Harris. And he's saying with regards to values, is it easier for families to build off a base of understanding as they are closer, but, or do you still find misunderstandings, misunderstandings that break down the trust? And how do you rebuild trust between members? And I'll give that to Elmarie. Oh, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Uh, I think trust itself is probably the most important value. Um, I think trust is, is a value um, that you need to foster in a family business. Um, and that goes for between generations, but also in the same generation. And, um, you know, as I said this morning, um, sometimes family conflict or a level of family conflict might be good to trigger certain processes and discussions and governance and succession. Um, but there is also in some families it be can become dysfunctional. But uh, that's one of the advantages, natural advantages of a family business is that you grew up with people that you trust. So um, if that's nurtured, that trust, that intergenerational and that mutual trust and understanding that also came out very strongly in my PhD is um, if you nurture that correctly, that's definitely a basis to maintain the other values and the relationships in the business. Dr. Beck? I think let me start by saying this, this the guy's question, um, I, I haven't even gotten something close in my research before on trust, but what I can say is just looking at ourselves as human beings, that if trust is broken and we're through misunderstandings, it's going to take an immense amount to build back up again. So just as we are um, as individual people, you can break not only the individual trust connections, but also between the families. And I'm just thinking about two different family nucleuses, uh, maybe two brothers, two sisters. Um, there needs to be trust within each nucleus as well as between the siblings as well. So it's very difficult that if trust is broken through a misunderstanding um, to then build back up again because it's going to take time and you're going to have to learn um, to trust that person again. Nikkei? Yes, rebuilding trust is not an easy journey, but really requires a lot of um, listening and demonstrating integrity. So in rebuilding trust, um, the, per the injured party has to really feel like whoever broke that, down that trust is really, really means what they say and says what they mean. So transparency is critical. Um, and um, a breakdown of trust is not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes I think negative um, events that happen within families actually create a platform for us to become stronger. They reveal the weaknesses we had within the family. And, you know, um, sometimes we have to be broken right down to be able to build up again on a stronger foundation. So. Um, once we identify that there, there has been a trust issue, we can then build up back again with, um, you know, demonstrating integrity and transparency. Andrea. Just want to say I agree um, with both Nikkei and Dr. Big. Um, so if you just take a step back, what is trust? So it's actually quite cool to have a trust equation, um, which is reliability, credibility. Also, it's like reliability plus credibility plus intimacy, which is relationship building. Um, so that all adds to trust, but that gets diminished. So divided by self-orientation or the orientation. So that's usually where, where trust breaks down. Um, if somebody is self-centered or they're making decisions to benefit themselves and not the collective group or not the family. Um, and obviously it can be restored if somebody says they apologize or and they communicate and they talk it through um, you know it, it makes people stronger it makes the group stronger um, and that all links again back to the values so what we've seen in our studies are that companies are um, that are managed with clear strong values and a clear purpose and an eye for legacy will tend to build trust and loyalty among the family members, the staff, the suppliers, the consumers, 
and will have a greater resilience during difficult times or downturns. Um, so, so that's very important. And but I still think, even in my own family, we've had a lot of breaking of trust or difficult times, and um, you hurt each other. Sometimes it's by accident. Sometimes it's you don't have the understanding. You don't know where the other person is coming from. Um, but because we're a family, we work through it. You blood is thicker than water. So it takes time, but but you can always rebuild and rework and come out strong on the other side. Well, that was powerful. Thank you. Um, welcome. Uh, I, I was dying to respond to this because I've got uh, in one of the cases, actually uh, three cases, but I'm just going to use one. Uh, Babalua's case said, we don't want to employ family members anymore, particularly extended families, because well, they have stolen something from them. And, uh, and then I've bound into a, an article which talks about the bad side of social capital. And, and I think it relates more into the family because uh, we're talking about relations and networking. I'm just looking at the family as a unit. I'm not talking about, you know, outsiders. Yesterday I said it is difficult for some of these businesses to employ family members because of the issues such as trustworthiness, which is not there. And if I may go back to Babalo's case, she said vividly, and I remember, never, never, never. When someone uses those strong words, you know that there's something, that deep underlying issues, that if they were are to be resolved, Really, it's probably going to take a lot of time to do that. But we know once trust is, is broken, it is difficult to rebuild. It, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like you know, one of the ingredients. Sometimes mixing sugar and salt, uh, it doesn't really give you the right you know, ingredient for the product that you want to, to make. I'm using my previous example. Why am I saying this? We know trust is an important is an important ingredient, but if if it is not well nourished among family members, then it could also become a, the downside. That's now the, the dark side of the of the social capital in the context of the family business. Well, uh, we know we still need to be you know to trust people. Generally, we need people that are trustworthy, people that are honest. But to get that, you know, it, it takes a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, you know, time and and believing in one another's, uh, in others, each other's uh, competencies, abilities, and even behaviors. Thank you. And finally, Professor Farrington. Uh, breakdowns in trust between family members do occur, but I do believe that the history that you have. And the relationships that you have will determine whether you can actually build up that trust again. Thank you. All right. I had said there were two questions, uh, but it seems the other question was answered. Um, I will just give the question and the answer that was given by uh, Elmarie. And if anyone else has, um, wants to add, um, I'll let you add as you give me your closing remarks. The question was from Le Seco, and she asked, uh, or he asked, have you been, have you seen correlation between values and longevity of the family values? And does this change when the company gets corp corporate, corporatized profesh or professionalized or not? And Professor Venter had responded, great question. Yes, there is a positive relationship between strong family values, commitment and longevity, especially in the light of SEW. It becomes harder and harder and harder if you have a diluted ownership. So to maintain family values when the family grow, grows to 50 or 100, it becomes important to create a family office where you employ a dedicated person just to teach all the shareholders and family members of the family what are the values. It is hard because family members then are not actively involved in the business and simply want the dividend at the end of the year. And in South Africa, the Ackerman family of pick and pay have a family office of over seven members, or maybe more already, where 
one person only educates the next generation how to be steward and how not to use social media etc and on that note i will open up um, the closing remarks from each panelist i will start with andrea and move on to nike professor farrington dr beck welcome and then last but not least professor venter andrea you have the floor uh, first of all, just thank you very much. It's been a privilege uh, learning and hearing everything on the panel. You are all wonderful. Um, so just my closing remark, it's again out of our reach, the research, and it shows that family businesses that make their values and purpose explicit and measurable and incorporate them into their strategic plans, see better returns and greater longevity. Um, so we know strategy that is extremely important and it drives the whole business. So just remember to bring that in, bring it into your KPIs. Um, when you employ people, keep that in mind, um, the values and whether they, when you buy additional businesses, keep that in mind, the personnel that comes in, um, the business partners, who you, yeah, who you partner with, um, it drives everything. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's so easy um, as family businesses to focus on the business system, strategy, procedures, um, but really um, at the heart of who we are is our values. And they are, they do contribute to this secret source and give us this cutting edge. So I'd really encourage families to really sit down, reflect, explicitly de de define and look to impart these values to the next generation so we can pass on the legacy and retain our competitive edge. So we're living in times where so much is driven. It highlights the importance of values um, that we instill them in our businesses. And as Prof. has indicated, they do contribute to longevity. Dr. Beck? Um, just from myself, I just want to thank everybody for being part of this conference. Um, this is something that um, just a few months ago, I think was, we were just dreaming about it. And um, for our own sake, I just hope that the theme of our conference of the first one being a moja becomes the values that we can strive for going forward, um, to strive for and maintain our unity, not just in the family, but in our societies and a group of people that really want family businesses to do well and to survive. So just thank you to everybody. Thank you to all my colleagues from all the different panelists who have been on here, who have given up their time from all the different organizations. Thank you very much. And we really do appreciate your contribution. Thank you, welcome. I just want to in part, as I do my closing remarks, also respond to the circle's question by reading a quote from Zinfek. I do so wish that we could carry this business, not only for us, but also for our children, you know, because I know that it is through the family business that I've managed to be where I am today. That statement to me does link, does provide a link between values, uh, longevity of the business and values that are contained in the family business. And thank you very much for listening and indulging in us uh, uh, the past two hours. I look forward to meet you in person for those that I haven't. God bless you. And Almari. I can just say amen, brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, and I also, Shelley actually took my sentence word by word. So they say great minds think alike and fools never differ. But uh, I really want to thank each and every one. Um, Titi, you and Nikkei that has done a great job. Um, but also for the presenters today, welcome um, Shelley, uh, Shelley, Andrea. Um, it is so fantastic to draw on a team like this and um, I've learned so much and I think we can still continue for many more hours. So um, I think um, the, the message has come through today, you know, that values are very important in succession and vice versa. And um, yes, I think we can end on that high note and uh, 
Thank you very much for everyone's contribution and also for the great questions we got from the attendees. Um, that always uh, really lighten up the discussion. Thank you once again to all our panelists and everybody who's part of the team behind the scenes. And we're looking forward to seeing you all tomorrow at 11 a.m. when we start our day four of the African Family Business Research Conference. Thank you and good night.